It's again time for my The Lord of the Rings Films and Books References and Differences series, where I go bit by bit through the films in the extended edition and try to explain all those in detail. Last episode we made our way through the Old Forest and the Barrow Downs chapters that are missing completely in the films, parts are however referenced. Now the Hobbits finally reach Bree, which will be the main topic for today's video. I really like this part in the films and books and was looking forward to this. Sadly I had some private stuff to do over the week and as a result this episode is a bit shorter again and we will cover the rest next time. Also spoiler warning and I tried to pronounce the names as Tolkien described it. As mentioned I always liked the scenes in Bree from the films. We don't see much of it but it has this dense atmosphere and it's the first huge contrast to the beautiful Shire. On the pronunciation side I'm a bit indifferent about how to say Bree. A while ago I decided to anglicize it because it's a multicultural place and also many hobbits, the small folk as they're called there, live there with men, the big folk, together in harmony. So I assume they say it in common speech in this region anyway, which is represented by modern English in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings related works. So anglicizing it makes the most sense. Also the names of the other villages are anglicized too. You could make an argument for the rolled R here but I still don't know what to make out of the two E's. Bree seems to be a Celtic or Brythonic name. If someone has some knowledge about those let me know what you think in the comments. However the name means hill and I could imagine the meaning was lost over time. It's also built at the slopes of and partially on a hill called Bree Hill which seems like a tautology in this context. Tolkien Gateway also mentions that Tolkien scholar Tom Shippey, I mentioned him several times in my last two videos, assumes that the village Brill in our world could be an inspiration for it. But there's no source for it on the side yet so take it with a grain of salt. Besides Bree, Tolkien mentions three other villages close by, Coombe, Stadel and Archet. But beyond that the region together with the Shire is pretty isolated. And I had to look up how to pronounce the first two names. There are for example Old English or Old Norse names in my videos, no problem. But often modern English is the actual final boss for me. The village or at least the Bree region developed most likely somewhere in the second age. The ancestors of the Bree landers were according to their own tales those of the Edain, a special group of men from the far east where men awoke who did not went to Numenor after the war of Wrath at the end of the first age and settled in this region. Others probably went over the misty mountains becoming the Norsemen. Over a very long time, so we are talking about the whole second age to mid third age, some important settlements and cities like Mithlond, Tharbat, Fornost and so on were built and roads connected them. Bree was built directly at a crossing of two important ones. The east road connecting for example the Blue Mountains or Mithlond that are the Grey Havens with for example Rivendell or the Misty Mountains and the Green Ray or former known as North Road connecting for example example Arnor with Gondor. We don't know when exactly Bree was built though. After the war in the north in the third age between Angmar and the remains of Arnor ultimately resulting in the destruction of both, the north road lost its purpose and was seldom used after that. As a result it wasn't really maintained anymore, becoming overgrown with green grass and so it became known as the Greenway. It becomes clear why Bree is still a meeting point for travelers from all around Middle Earth, be it dwarves, elves or men, including hobbits. However later in the third age some hobbits seem to have settled in the Shire and Buckland from here and they, even though it's very close, became quite isolated from Bree later on. Tolkien writes that Shire hobbits were seldom seen in the village, even though hobbits still lived there. What I find really fascinating is that the Shire as anachronism is quite advanced in many ways compared to the rest of Middle Earth. Visiting Bree is a bit like the first station of traveling into the Hobbits and the Shire's past and as they continue their journey they seem to move further away from their own time if that makes sense. In this context I really love the depiction of Bree. It feels like a middle ground between the ancient places that they will visit later in the story and 
and The Shire. It also has this gritty feeling to it, especially in the films. The rain adds to this and is a strong contrast to The Shire, but the weather is to my knowledge not mentioned in the book. Butterbur says it never rains, but it pours in brie. But he means this metaphorically. Maybe this is some kind of filmic play with words, but I think the rain is just there to add to the atmosphere. The rain and the mud also resulted in making it difficult for actors and horses to move through the location. Many scenes and dialogues from the books are still in the film for the breeze scenes, but there are also many changes. What I really like is that the film tries to keep the spirit of the book chapters in a way. The scene with the hobbit standing in front of Bree, which in the film happens directly after they cross the Brandywine River with the ferry, already has multiple changes, but still captures the essence of what is written. We see Frodo, Sam, Merry and Pippin standing in front of the closed entrance gate of Bree, which is closed at night with a gatekeeper behind it. This is in the book too, but there are also several differences. In the book, the hobbits are on four ponies, with another one carrying their supplies. These ponies are missing in the films completely at this point. The first one, called Bill, appears when they leave Bree, and that's in the book too. Then we see a stone wall around Bree. In the books that's a bit different and there's a dike and a hatch on the inner side around Bree until it meets the Bree Hill. But where roads enter Bree they cross the dike and there's a gate. We also can't see how the wall continues in the film scene and it fades into trees and brushes. Maybe it's just around the gate area but the dike is still missing. The word dike is translated with trench in the German version and I would be interested to know what nature speakers imagine when they hear dyke with a hatch on the inner side as a description. The dialogue scene with the gatekeeper asking the hobbit some questions gruffly is pretty similar to the books. I like the detail of a lower hatch for hobbits in the door, which was a design idea of Ellen Lee. The gatekeeper is called Harry Goatleaf and in the books he is a bit more suspicious. Also most Bree names have a botanical connection. The whole interaction with the people in Brie is very different than what we see in the films. There's a whole conspiracy going on and the gatekeeper is involved. In the film it feels more like he's just doing his job and the poor guy is later even crushed by the gate. He explains that he does have to ask questions at night, which he does in the book too. Actually many parts of the dialogue are right out of the book. He's also the first man, so of the big folk the hobbits meet and he also recognizes where they are from by hearing them talk, both in film and book. A very Tolkien typical detail and it reveals to the gatekeeper an important information to identify them. The hobbits are now allowed to enter and in the movie we see a shot of Bree. The location for this is actually an old military base from World War II. The shot is also mostly a matte painting but they actually built the house facades. Now the filmmakers needed a lot of trickery to generate the illusion of the hobbits being small. It was really well done and required building a small and a big version of a lot of things and people walking on stilts. On the streets we also have the cameo of Peter Jackson eating a carrot. He was supposed to smoke a pipe but he got sick of it so he went with a carrot. I also love those shots in the busy streets. It all has this gothic style to it. Now in the book the gatekeeper suspiciously looks after the hobbits for quite some time, which Frodo can tell by the light cone of his lantern, which he has in the film too. And then another important character is mentioned in the book. Tolkien does a neat little trick here. A dark figure, the book does not reveal who it is yet, climb quickly over the gate while the keeper returned to his booth. When I first read it I thought about this being a black rider who will talk in secret to Harry, but a bit later it's revealed that this is not the case. It's Strider, following the hobbits in secret and showing how good he is at traveling unseen. As Gandalf said, Aragorn, the greatest traveler and huntsman of this age of the world. However, I like how Tolkien plays with our expectations here, just giving us this little information in a certain context, but resolving it a chapter later. You could say the film trick counterpart of this writing trick was cutting the Nazgul stabbing scene and the hobbit sleeping in their bed scene together. We talk about that next episode. 
The hobbits left their ponies outside in the yard and before entering the inn, they hear singing and a burst of laughter from inside. Rereading the chapter, it reminded me of the scene in the Green Dragon Inn in the Shire, where Merry and Pippin sing on the table. I could imagine this being a reference because it's relatively quiet in the inn of the film, while in the books the hobbits telling stories from the Shire and Frodo singing on the table inside the prancing pony plays a big role too. So the Green Dragon Inn scene of the film really seems to reference this a bit. Then the four hobbits talk to the innkeeper, Baliman Butterbur. I don't know how native speakers feel about his name, but in the German translation his first name is very literally translated and feels a bit weird for a first name. Baliman, which is Gerstmann, it makes sense for someone who brews ale I guess, but sounds quite alien in the German translation. But I have to admit Baliman Butterbur sounds cool in English. However, Butterbur is translated with a German word for buttercup. My botanic knowledge is not that great, especially botanic names in English, so I didn't notice for a long time that Buttercup and Butterbur are two different things. As far as I know, Tolkien asked the translators to keep the butter part in the translation, which would not be present in the actual translation of the name Butterbur, which has the really weird name Pestwurz in German. In the History of Middle-earth book The Return of the Shadow, we can also read that he originally was planned to be named Timothy Titus and then Barnabas Butterbur, very biblical names. In early drafts he was also planned to be a hobbit, even knowing Tom Bombadil, but all this changed later. The inspiration for the name according to the book Peoples of Middle-earth came from a gravestone in South England with Barnabas Butter written on it and Tolkien was somehow reminded of it when he worked on the book. However, Butterbur was described in the books as a short stout man with a bald head and a red face. In the films he's not really bald, but I think David Weatherly works quite well too. Also two hobbits called Nob and Bob worked for him too. He seems always very busy, but talkative at the same time. In the film and book Frodo introduces himself as Mr. Underhill when the landlord asked for a name. And in the book for a moment it seemed Butterbur remembered something hearing this name. This is also a bit referenced in the film dialogue when they talk about Gandalf, but it's actually quite different in the book. But what Butterbur remembered we will discuss in the next episode, where we will also see some similarities, but also many differences between books and films. Thank you for watching. I know this episode is a bit weird and short, but it's for sure not the last and I hadn't the time over the week for a longer episode. I plan to continue it quite soon though. Next week is Gamescom, so I potentially make a game related video first, if I find an interesting topic. I personally really love the Bree section and I'm looking forward to continuing the rest of it. Also, if you are new, the playlist for this series is in the description. You can also check my other lore videos on my channel if you are interested. Interested. If you liked it, please press the like button and leave a comment. In case you want to subscribe, consider pressing the annoying bell for notifications. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.